In a dusty old shop on a forgotten old street, you'll find two witches with books three boxes deep. Next to rusty old needles and faded red thread, you'll come in for yarn, but leave with pigments instead. Whether poisons or patterns, we're always discreet. Where creepy and crafty and morbidity meet. Welcome to the Bones and Bobbins podcast. Hello, Morbid Makers. We are your slightly creepy, mildly disconcerting, somewhat sinister, delightfully discomposed, opaquely odd, merrily morbid, marvelously misanthropic hosts. <laughs> I guess I could have said hosts. I didn't, though. <laughs> I had you. Uh, <laughs> Whatever, it's fine. Um, Hi, I'm Haley from Red Handled Scissors and the Very Serious Crafts Podcast. And hi, I'm Natalie from Uber Dark Designs, an official murderino maker. Fancy. Welcome to Season 1, Episode 3 of Bones and Bobbins Podcast. Excellent. So today we're going to talk about death masks Ooh. and specifically, um, a- and just for clarity, I'm going to be speaking about European death masks and death mask culture. Funeral masks, such as those used in ancient Egyptian and ancient Greek cultures, deserve an episode of their own. Agreed. Yes. So... Death masks, as we are speaking of them now, are a modeled replica of a dead person's face. So, exactly what it says on the tin. Um, when it comes to making death masks, generally speaking, royalty and people of culturally prominent positions are the subjects. Or were. They aren't anymore. Because we don't do this generally these days um so what are death masks actually used for from the middle ages to the 19th century they were largely just used as reference models for sculptors who were creating likenesses or busts or statues of the deceased person um And it wasn't until the 1800s that masks themselves became items of interest and value to the public. Because Victorians and their love of memento mori crafts. Yes. Yes, they did love those. So, during the night... Or during the 18th and 19th centuries, masks took on a job entirely different than their previous uses. In a world before forensic photography, they also became a way to permanently record the features of unknown corpses in the hopes that they might be identified later. Ooh. Which is a really interesting use for that and makes a lot of sense, especially if there was an embalming going on. It does. And kudos for trying to find, like, the actual people versus just being like, meh, we don't know. Just throw them in the mass grave. Yeah, it's a very interesting use that I hadn't actually heard before, but it makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And I mean, yeah, it's it just... Yes. Yes, that. <laughs> um, so, okay. So, if for some reason your face upon death was not an appropriate subject for a mask, uh, read damaged when you died, Oof. hands were also a common substitute. Ah. I did not know that. I don't know that I've ever seen any hand masks. Are they still masks if they're on your hands? Right? Casting? Mm. Make make mine just the middle finger. (laughs) (laughs) Noted. (laughs) 
All right. Now, if people listen to this and you end up dead, (laughs) I am so going to jail. (laughs) Damn it. Sorry. Okay. So, the making of death masks is the next logical step here. So, though they aren't medical in nature, physicians actually traditionally made the plaster molds used to create a death mask because they were, generally speaking, with the body, or would be very soon with the body. True. Upon death. Um, Plus access to gauze. uh, True. And death masks were usually made using wax, paper, or plaster, and they needed to be made as soon as possible after death so no distortion of features would occur, which is also something that makes a lot of sense that I hadn't necessarily thought of. Yeah. Yeah. So let's get into how to actually do this, just in case you're feeling frisky. (laughs) So to make a death mask, you would first grease the face and facial hair and any other hair that would be covered by the mask because skin is extremely delicate Mm. after you die and hair also pulls out pretty easily and so you need to grease up everything so nothing rips when you pull the mask off yeah and i assume that was learned quite accidentally (laughs) the hard way the very Mm, hard way Yeah, so the actual mask-making method after you're all greased up isn't very different from modern paper mache or plaster casting. Wet plaster bandages were carefully laid on the face, layer by layer. The first layer captured the details, like even minute details, like individual hairs and wrinkles and pores, which is wild to me. Um... And then the subsequent layers reinforced that first detail layer. And so once the mold was dry and hardened, which now happens pretty quickly, but, um, well, with the current plaster bandages of today happens quickly. Mm -hmm. At that time, it took an hour or more. And that really speaks to why you need to do this as soon as possible after the death. Um, so the mold would be peeled off the face once hardened, leaving a negative impression of the face. And then wax or metal could be poured into that negative to make a three-dimensional death mask. And they can be extremely detailed or decorated. And sometimes the facial expressions of the same person were even changed to make different versions of masks for different things which seemed very interesting to me it is i've seen uh far uh, far more death masks um researching this than i thought that i would ever see and some of them uh like the mustache, the details were amazing. Yes. When you consider the basic supplies used, the fact that it was a dead body, and as soon as you die, you start decomposing, and just the time period. But yeah, some, I mean, you could see each individual mustache whisker. Um, yeah. It's just crazy. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense because the additional weight of those extra plaster layers mm-hmm. on top both stabilize and press it into all of the creases and all of the hairs. So all of that weight that you're adding to make it stable actually makes the detail layer even more accurate, Um, which is cool. It's very cool. Yeah, and so in case you were wondering, life masks are also a thing, and they seem to be frequently used to record now scientifically disproven ideas regarding the role of physical features in criminality or race. Hmm. Um, And 
I mean, life masks are certainly things, like, living people cast masks all the time now, and they aren't that. But at the time, that's what they were used for. And also phrenology was a thing at the time. And so, the life masks seemed like a much more questionable pursuit, in my opinion. I agree. But, yeah. So, <clears throat> quite inappropriately, the only thing I could think of while researching this particular topic was Cynthia Plastercaster, who made a plaster cast of Jimi Hendrix's, and many other rock stars, penis in the late 1960s. <laughs> wow. Yes. And you too can see this um, on the internet. Just go ahead and Google Cynthia Plastercaster if you would like to see some rock star dicks because, well, you can certainly see the detail. <laughs> Cynthia. My goodness. I wonder what she did with all of them. Is that like a thing? Is that an exhibit? Uh, yeah, there's an exhibit. Rock hawk. Uh, they are they are art. I can't. Re- I think that actually might be what it was called. <laughs> I, I can't remember. My goodness. But uh, yeah. So <clears throat> moving on. Uh, there are tons more. Er, there are tons of more historical and perhaps more appropriate subjects of casting. And one of them, whether you know it or not, has probably been seen by almost everyone. Right? And we will get to that um, in just a minute. Um, Mm -hmm. As I'm sure Jimi Hendrix's penis is hanging somewhere appropriately. Uh, (laughs) These death masks. Uh, So basically, Edinburgh's University and Anatomy Museum, Scotland Yard's Crime Museum, and America's Princeton University... All have the largest collections of death masks. Sounds right. Um, Historical figures, royalty, artists, poets, musicians. And because of our wonderful wonderful Victorians that were transfixed by like gruesome murder stories. There's Mm -hmm. also um, executed villainy death masks of the Edinburgh murder and body snatcher. William Burke and the Australian outlaw Ned Kelly. Ooh, burking. Right. That's uncomfortable. <clears throat> so uh, some of these masks have become highly collectible. Um, and it is rumored that many Masonic lodges all have their own personal copies of death masks. Um, one of Well, Nicole- you can make as many copies as you want to. Right. Once you've got them old. Uh, so Napoleon, one of Napoleon taken shortly after he died in exile in St. Helena, uh, mm-hmm. In 1821, sold at Bonhams in London in 2013 for approximately two hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Which oh wow! Right? And side note, hearkening back to the previous episode, he may or may not have died from arsenic <laughs> poisoning due to wallpaper. <laughs> right? I wonder if the mask had like a little green tint to it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's not funny, but it's funny. It, it is. Um, mm-hmm. Also, the death the death mask of nato- of a notorious Victorian murderer, Benjamin Cavassier. I learned this week. I'm not that great at French, so I'm probably going to mispronounce a bunch of things. But um, he was hung in 1840, and his hanging was witnessed by a crowd of 40,000, including Charles Dickens, which I did not know Charles liked to go to the hangings. But they found it. Well, I mean, everybody went to that. I suppose. Uh, So they found it in an outbuilding on a remote farm in Cumbria in the north of England. And it fetched $26,000 at auction. So that was pretty impressive. But like you said, the most popular desk mask, uh, you may not even realize, goes by several names. Indeed. Officially, she is referred to as Le Le Conan de la Seine. Which translates into, <laughs> right, which I listened to three different pronunciations and I'm like, I'm just going to end up messing it up anyway. Uh, but it's translated into the unknown woman of the same. 
Um, and also the Mona Lisa of the Saint is another name that she goes by. But her true identity remains unknown, so her real name may never actually be known to us. Around 18, late 1880s, the body of a roughly 16-year-old young lady was pulled out of the River Seine and transported to the Paris mortuary, where, like we mentioned, she was put on public display along the other bodies of unknown dead for purpose of identification. Since the body showed no signs of violence, suicide was suspected. Um, and this parade of nameless corpses was actually like a popular diversion in its day. And people were super drawn to her because she had this just super peaceful look upon her face. Um, and so they liked, the, you know, the crowds would crowd around her body there, but no one knew who she was. Oh, but, yeah. This was when, like, going to the morgue was right? a legit entertainment. That's you, you just went to the morgue to look at the unidentified bodies. You should probably bring that back. It would probably help, you know, solve some stuff. You never know. I agree. But legend has it that the pathologist on duty became so entranced by her face and her, she has this enigmatic half smile that he asked a molder to take a plaster cast of her face. Well, not long after that, uh, the mask uh, and replications of it began to appear for sale outside the molder's workshop on the left bank. And soon the young woman's face became a muse for artists novelists and poets all were super eager to imagine her identity and stories all around this mysterious drowned Mona Lisa so many stories like some swear she was just too healthy for the mask to have been taken it taken from a corpse there's a deep dive of stories inspired by just this one face in and of itself not even to you know to the rest of this story here it's really amazing. Like, if you want to do some reading, just start that. Just start that rabbit hole. It's really interesting. So I didn't realize there were conspiracy theories. Oh, there are. There's so many. <laughs> one of them. I is, mean, of course there are. One of them is uh, she was half of a ger a set of German twins, and uh, <laughs> one of them ran. She ran off to Paris, and her sister didn't. And uh years and years you know but she disappeared in paris and years and years later the german sister found her face on a wall and there's so many things um wow but so do you know how she became a face that you may have locked lips with hmm. <laughs> let me tell you so, oh yes please in 1955 asmond lerdel saved his young son's life pulling his lifeless water body from the water just in time and clearing his airways. At the time, Lairdell was also a successful Norwegian toy manufacturer and had just started playing with this newly discovered substance called plastic. So he used, ah. yeah, so he used a soft and malleable substance that he manufactured, one of the most famous playthings. Um, it was an, it was a called doll that he named Anne which in post-war Norway was acclaimed toy of the year because she had those little eyes that were sleeping. It would like uh, open and close. Oh, the open and close. Yeah. Yeah. Those creepy ones and uh -huh. natural hair. So when a group of medical professionals needed a training aid for the newly invented CPR procedure and they went to him because he manufactured dolls, he was, it was a super logical go-to for them. And with the procedure being so close to his heart after saving his own son's life, he was like all in. So he developed yeah. a torso or whole body mannequin, which simulates an unconscious patient requiring CPR. Mm -hmm. He wanted the mannequin to have a natural appearance, but he also felt that a female doll would be less threatening to the trainees. So, <laughs> you know, I... Feel Seriously. somewhat deadlier than most men. Right? So, uh, he was trying to figure out the face for it. And it would be a mask that he remembered seeing on the wall of his grandparents' house many years ago. And he decided... Can you imagine walking right. into your grandparents and there were just death masks on the wall? Right. I mean, I would be into it, but... Right, but it would be like, hey, what's up? Please tell me you were close to that person or you just have a random face on your wall. Um, But that mask was, you guessed it, it was Le, Le Canu de la Seine. It was our lovely little faceless 
Parisian pulled from the same. And that's how an unidentified corpse of a young lady became the most kissable face and the most popular death mask in the world. And it's estimated that over 300 million people have been trained in CPR using Recessa Anne, which we have renamed to Recessa Kate. Recessa Kate. <laughs> but that's how she got because the Because they really missed it. They did. But- you know, that makes so much more sense. I was really wondering why they didn't go with Resuscitate. Right. I was really upset that they were creative enough to create, you know, a CPR dummy from a death mask, but then, you know, went with such a name. But it makes sense in this case. And the fact that, you know, he had to perform that procedure on his son. And it, <clears throat> yeah. It's just, it was so fascinating to me that this poor woman who, you know, and, and her face is absolutely beautiful when you look at the photo they have a photo of her face not before they did the mask just the photo of her Mm -hmm. actual face and it's just beautiful some of one of one of the the mini beheaded wives uh her death mask is also (laughs) incredibly beautiful um of henry the eighth yeah (laughs) you know Uh uh-huh so, okay, the beheaded wives. The beheaded wives. <laughs> just the whole group of them, you know? Just well, There was. But mm-hmm. I kind of hope that someday they can they can figure out who who Anne was. Or not Anne, but... Contact DNA. Right. I want to know gotta be where there. that original mask is, or right? where the original cast is. Exactly. So now we all know. She may not have a name, but we all know her real well. It's true. And those eyelashes, man... I am deeply jealous. (sighs) Well, continuing on with death, (laughs) let's uh, travel back in time about 2,000 years. Just 2,000? Yep. That'll do. (laughs) Yep. All right. So we're going to talk about the Paris Catacombs. Which is a subject near and dear to my heart because building shit with bones and I've never been there and I really want to go. Yes. And so now I both really want to go even more and never want to go ever, ever. Same. Um, in equal measures. Yeah. <clears throat> so the tunnels were begun, the tunnels being the tunnels under Paris, were begun by the Romans after they conquered Gaul about 2,000 years ago. Uh, The land in that area uh, that we now know as Paris was rich in limestone, which the Romans quarried to build the city above, which seems like a terrible idea to me. Though I do believe that when the Romans were quarrying, it was largely in open quarries, not tunneling. Mm. Um, because following generations would follow suit, but the first historical mention of subterranean mines isn't until the 13th century. But also, can you imagine being an underground miner in medieval Paris? Mm -mm. I feel very new about that. Mm -mm. A lot of nope. Yes, a whole universe of nope. All right. So now let's fast forward to... Ooh, and now I'm going to do French poorly. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, Les Innocents Cemetery, referred to in English as Holy Innocent Cemetery, which is where we're going to go Okay, with that, um, in the late 1700s, where things were really not going well. Mm -hmm. So decomposing bodies, as it turns out, are extremely smelly. And in the late 1700s, local businesses around the Holy Innocent Cemetery, which was one of the largest and oldest cemeteries in Paris, were just not having it anymore. Even perfume makers were like, nope, that is too much. So um, in 1780, because this was becoming such a problem, cemeteries were finally closed and burials within 
the city of Paris were forbidden, um, and this was during the reign of Louis the Fifteenth. Okay. And so, enter the ossuary. 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 Sounds That's right. where we're gonna go. <laughs> That's fine. Enter the ossuary, which would eventually be called the catacombs. Um, it was conceived as an idea to relieve Paris's literally overflowing cemeteries. In the spring of 1780, due to months of rain, cemetery walls were actually collapsing and spilling bodies into spaces where bodies definitely weren't supposed to be. Oh, no. Um, yeah, for example, in the basement of a neighboring apartment building. Oof. So that's fun. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and now, just for a little bit more context, um, the Holy Innocent Cemetery was an active cemetery for nearly ten centuries. That's a lot of bodies. Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> No. And the population in Paris in the late 1700s was continuing to grow. Oh, boy. Yes. So, let's talk about how this cemetery problem happened in the first place. The rise of Christianity in medieval Paris did away with the pagan practice of cremation. So, suddenly, every literal body that died actually needed to be put somewhere. Which seems deeply inconvenient to me. Right? But Paris was a walled city and wasn't actually able to expand. But people kept dying anyway, like people do. <laughs> and so... Cemeteries would become necessary and also a problematic thing. So, how cemeteries worked in Paris from medieval times until the 1770s, yes, that's correct, medieval wow. times until the 1770s, was... Basically, everyone, regardless of station, was buried in mass graves. Oh. And, yeah, and said graves were dug up after a few years, and the bones were then put inside charnel houses that surrounded the cemetery, and the land was reused again for burials. But even so... um. Seven to ten centuries of burials was still more than the city cemeteries could contain. So they just stopped containing. Oh my gosh. Can you imagine being the person that had to dig them back up? Worse yet, the one that had oh, to we're, te test to see yeah. if they were ready yet. <laughs> oh, we're headed there. Oh. Just wait. Oh, yay. Yes. So meanwhile, 65 feet under the city... The maze of tunnels from the quarry, or the quarries from the past, were just sitting around, being dangerous. Um, the open spaces from those quarries began caving in and causing streets to collapse oh. and buildings to sink. And those areas urgently needed reinforcement. Conveniently... This was around the same time that the cemetery wall collapses were taking place in the city above. Hmm. And so now, they had a bunch of newly cleaned up and reinforced tunnels, and they had a lot of bones that needed to go somewhere. So the solution became pretty obvious. Beginning in 17. 85 and continuing after the French Revolution until 1814, the remains housed in most of the cemeteries in Paris were moved in nightly covered wagon processions to a mine shaft to the quarries below the city, which had been opened specifically for that purpose. And I was 
sort of surprised to learn that the very last deposits to these quarries were made in 1860. That's a substantial amount of time. Yeah. And so the site was consecrated as the Paris Municipal Ossuary on April 7th of 1786. But people decided to call it the catacombs because they were obsessed with Roman catacombs, which had been recently uncovered. Yeah. Yes. So the actual name did not stick. Catacombs, however, did. So as early as 1809, the public could visit by appointment, oh. which is, I wouldn't have thought that, um, and today, about half a million people visit annually, except not this year, because pandemic. Yeah. Yes. Oh, and we just had an ambulance siren <laughs> happen, as I said, pandemic, so that's great. Yeah, it's lovely. I feel, I feel good about that. Um, so, you may be wondering how it got kind of pretty. It is. Because bones, it it is pretty, but it's only pretty in very superficial ways, Mm -hmm. which I learned in my research. So, before 1809, the bones had just been kind of tossed in and loosely piled. They were just there and kind of forgotten about. But in 1809, Inspector, oh boy, Heracard de Thuré. Thuré? Who knows? (laughs) I I don't know. I don't speak French. Um, We're going to go with de Thuré. Would head up an effort to decoratively arrange the bones. Hmm. And so, as you enter what is presently the catacombs, you'll see a sign that reads, Stop! This is the Empire of Death. In French. I'm not even going (laughs) to try. No. Throw me German. I can do that. French? Mm -mm. Hmm. Spanish? Sure. Not French. Uh, so, inside the catacombs are masonry monuments in both antique and Egyptian styles. So, like, there are Doric columns down there, altars and tombs. And um, De Thury also had the workers build artistic facades to increase sort of the gravity of the space hmm. um, with, with the bones. And so the most recognizable are probably two features, which are the Crypt of the Sepulchral Lamp, which is a giant wall with, that's made of long bones, probably femurs, um, with skulls, and it's sort of the design that is that has skulls in a cross shape mm-hmm. that people have probably seen in pictures. Yep. And you also probably will recognize the Rotunda de Tibias, which is a column of skulls and tibias. So it's this beautiful round column that has just different layers of very ornately placed skulls and tibias from ground to ceiling. Which is which beautiful. And it's also it's beautiful. Really amazing that an inspector would have such an artistic approach to it. Oh, just wait. (laughs) But it's also very confusing because now. Yes. Because so it's it's not okay to cremate. But let's just take five or six million bodies and just hodgepodge them all over the place. Like, I mean, to be fair, it's the medieval Parisians. That's true. 
who decided that um, cremation was the work of the devil and or the witches. So the witches. Yeah, I I feel like this was maybe almost habitual, like the maintaining of the bearing of bones. I mm-hmm. am not terribly familiar with the religious practices of France during that time, so I can't really weigh in. But so this this inspector who is having all of these decoratively arranged bones also had the workers create a retaining wall made of stacked tibias and femurs with a decorative skull row. And it's literally a retaining wall. Wow. Behind it, it is holding back Piles and piles of less artfully placed bones. Yeah. And the reason for that is because a lot of them are in pieces. Ugh, yeah. Because they were either dumped into the quarries and broke then, or they're just so old. And so there is this really intense wall that goes about as far as the eye can see that is the retaining wall holding back the rest of these remains. Hmm. And it's a pretty powerful sight, at least from the photos. Right. (laughs) Um, And I think that my favorite thing that Dithuri did was he had two cabinets built in the style of Cabinets of Curiosities. Ooh! Yeah, and one was dedicated to minerals okay. from the mines. So, you know, crystal witches represent. Yeah. <laughs> and then one was dedicated to pathology. Really? Yes, and now I'm... I am sure that this wasn't done delicately. I am sure that this was done in a problematic manner. Oh, I'm I have sure. not seen it, but I'm thinking it definitely side show. Foca- yeah, <laughs> it definitely focused on visible illnesses in the bones and malformations. So I kind of want to read a, a book about this guy now because there's a lot of questions. Yeah, there's a lot. Of I mean, I'm sure that there is a book about him. I did not read one, but I'm quite certain. And so, now that you sort of have a feel Mm -hmm. for what it looks like, um, consider that there are about five to six million bodies down there. So many. Yeah. And that the actual decorative formations are having to be constantly rebuilt and rearranged for stability. Wow. Because they're just bones. They're just bones that are stacked. Right. They aren't being held together by any sort of masonry tools. Even now? No. Wow. Um, And so, like, those retaining walls are under constant repair so they can continue to contain. Right. And... So I I just thought that was interesting because I it is. I guess I never would have thought of that. And so overall there are about 800 meters, which is around half a mile of corridors that are lined with bones and those bone retaining walls. Which seems like a lot. That that but does. It, it does, but the thing is um after 2,000 years of digging for limestone, there are about 180 miles of catacombs under Paris. That's so much. Yeah, and less than half a mile of those 180 miles of tunnels are actually open and visible to the public. And uh, now I would like to move on to my 
most disgusting and fun fact <laughs> from this research before handing it over to you. Okay. Um, and th- this bit of information is entitled, Holy Fuck, They Made Candles and Soap Out of People. <gasps> yeah. That's some Sweeney Todd shit. And, well, so, this combines two of my favorite things, which is the idea of catacombs, um, and also a thing that bodies do. So, fun fact, in 1786, as the remains were being moved to catacombs, a bunch of bodies were found that just hadn't fully decomposed. Ooh. Instead of bones, they found adipocere, which is my favorite thing that bodies do. Um, it's also known as corpse wax. And it's basically a deposit of human body fat that forms under certain burial conditions. That and makes sense. Yeah, so you might have heard of this in medical museum displays um, described as people who turned into soap. Wow. And Yeah, so adipocere is just fascinating to me. And it's such a good word. Yeah. And so as they exhumed these bodies, they just went ahead and collected the adipocere and made candles and soap from it. Holy fuck. (laughs) And so what I'm saying is 1780s Parisians are way more metal than you or I will ever be. For sure. Yeah, they just win. They do. They made literal candles and soap out of corpse wax. Take that, Fight Club. And there is, like, it's so nonchalant that it's like a one-line mention anywhere that I could even find it mentioned. It was just a BT dubs. (laughs) Yeah, but it's also mentioned in reputable sources. Yeah. So it isn't, like... So it's legit. Yeah, I mean, it isn't like the... um, the rumors around Nazis making soap with people, which have been largely disproved, thank goodness. Right. But, yeah. Holy wow. shit. Holy yeah. shit, indeed. My holy shit was, oh my god, claustrophobia. When I... <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> I was going through, I started watching so many videos. So many videos, and uh, there was one where I could barely, barely breathe. It, it got so cramped. So I want to start uh-huh. out by uh, a little lesson. There are these people called cataphiles, mm-hmm. and they are pretty much people who study and explore the catacombs regularly. Uh, yeah, and began... illegally, right? Yeah, that, yes, very illegally, but it, with respect. And it, it, mm-hmm. they're said to have begun around, like, the late 60s. But they go about restoring some of the spaces. They organize Mm -hmm. uh, and they make way for innovative creative spaces or even themed neighborhoods. Yep. Some of these cataphiles will go down to the catacombs for a day, sometimes a night, sometimes a week to explore, to paint, to create maps, to clean up rooms, and to dig chateres, which I probably just butchered, but they're very narrow tunnels that only one can crawl through. And I saw this very little tiny guy crawl oh, through no. one of those very narrow tunnels, and I about just had to turn it off because it was crazy pants. Um, no, I'm child sized, and I still right. want no part of this. So let's dig into some legends behind the catacombs. One of the earliest yes, legends starts out in 1793 with Philibert Apser. Uh, he was a doorman at the Val de Grace Hospital. And Philbert went on a mission one night to retrieve some liqueur from a cellar. Only poor little Philbert went wandering into the catacombs instead, alone, with just a single candle. So he became incredibly lost and incredibly confused, and everybody, you know, said he was 
probably a little bit tipsy at the time, too, because he was going down for a refill. <laughs> and eventually his candle mm. blew out and the pitch bark yep. black made it pretty much impossible for him to find his way out. So it was 11 years later that they found poor little Phil Bear. And uh, they identified him by the hospital key ring that was hanging from his belt. He's actually buried in the catacombs, perhaps as a warning, exactly where he died. And the legend of his death is described on his tombstone. Now, catacombs for folklore say that he was actually really close to an exit. Um, and every November 3rd, his ghost haunts the labyrinth of the catacombs. Did you know that the, there is still a hospital on that site and that that basement still exists? Wow. Yeah. Hopefully they have better signs. Just saying. <laughs> I don't, it, it's unstable. I don't think they allow you <laughs> down there. <laughs> also, uh, during World War II, just to reiterate how long and winding these tunnels are, the yeah. resistance used portions of the catacombs as hideouts. And mm. ironically, the Nazis also created bunkers inside the catacombs. Yes. So it's interesting that they had those and then couldn't, like, that's crazy pants. Yeah. And they uh, were so close together. Like, right. it's amazing. It is. Uh, so one of the creepiest and incidentally the most controversial of the Paris catacomb legends takes oh. place yeah, in the early 1990s. So, allegedly, a group of cataphiles discovered a video camera on the ground. Oh, I know what this is. <laughs> caked in mud and clearly there for some time. Surprisingly, yep. this camera had footage on it. And it's of what we presume is a man uh, that appears lost and scared and trying to make their way through the catacombs. And at one point, they begin to run. Uh, out in the, as they're running, the breath becomes more and more heavy um, the motion becomes more frantic, uh, like they're either trying to escape something or just becoming desperate to get out and panicking. And yeah. then the video ends abruptly with the camera being dropped to the ground. Now, I watched the mm, alleged That's reassuring. Footage. Right. And it was super Blair Witchy. Like, it was yeah. super, super Blair Witchy. Um, and you can deep dive. Again, this is another really good deep dive. There's a ton of different theories behind the video and the legitimacy of it. It was originally mm -hmm. aired on like an ABC family Halloween special. As part <laughs> really? of it. Yeah, as like part of this thing. And they're saying, oh, it was made up by them and, and it didn't really happen. <coughs> and hmm. um, But I fully encourage the dive. Um, and it'll also link you when you start diving into legends of other people that have allegedly entered illegal parts of the catacombs never to be seen from again. Um, oh, I'm sure it happens a lot. I'm, I'm willing to bet. Uh, so in addition to, uh, you know, creepy caked up video cameras, there's also there's secret altars. There are art galleries with some incredible artwork. I was blown away by oh, yeah. some of this. And there's like graffiti in there that goes back to like the French Revolution. It is <laughs> it is incredible. Uh, but there's also swimming pools. And in more recent years, the catacombs have become host to secret underground parties. Uh, and well, of course. What else are you going to do with catacombs? Right? Cataphiles will tell you that they uh, they suspect there is at least one concert down there as early as 1817, which again are freaky little Victorian French. I would totally buy that that they had a party down there. Uh, well, that actually makes some sense. Um, they're in the catacombs at the Victorian cemetery near me. They do concerts because the it, acoustics has to be pretty good. Yeah, and so I could see that. Sure. But parties are, they're nothing compared to my favorite find. Oh. Yes. So John Henley uh, wrote in The Guardian on Wednesday the 8th of September 2004 that mm -hmm. police were undertaking and a training exercise in a large and previously uncharted uh, cavern of the catacombs. And mm -hmm. they stumbled upon something really unexpected. There was a desk there and a closed circuit TV camera set to automatically record images of anybody passing. Now, it also had a mechanism. What? Yeah, also had a mechanism that 
triggered a tape of dogs barking and I quote, clearly designed to frighten people off. Yeah, because I was like, what? There's dogs <laughs> down here? It gets better. So further along past that, the tunnel opens up to a vast 400 square meter cave, some 18 meters underground. And it was, and I quote, like an underground amphitheater with terraces cut into rock and chairs. There, the police found a full sized cinema screen, projection oh. equipment. Projection equipment and tapes of a wide variety of films, including 1950s film noir classics and more recent thrillers. None of the films were banned or even offensive. A smaller oh. cave next door had been turned into an informal restaurant and bar. The spokesperson said there were bottles of whiskey and other spirits behind the bar, tables and chairs, and a pressure cooker for making couscous. Because, you know, you're in the catacombs. Whiskey and couscous in a little movie. How did they power the pressure cooker? How did they power any of it? The, the whole thing ran off of a professionally installed electricity system. And there was at least three phone lines down there. What? <laughs> it gets better. <laughs> three days later, the police return, accompanied by a bunch of French electricity board members, to see where the power was coming from and the phones and electricity lines had been cut. Everything was gone. And there was a note in the middle of the floor that said, of course, in French, but I'm saying it in English, do not try to find us. Well, okay. Almost everything that I read said, nobody knows who it was. They never figured out who it was, but. Oh, somebody knows who it was. Well, I found on Wikipedia that Le UX, which is short for the Urban Experiment, is an underground organization that improves hidden quarters of Paris. So they've done, they've restored the Pantheon clock. Uh, they've restored medieval crypts. They've staged plays and readings and monuments after dark. And what do you know? They built a cinema complete with a bar and a restaurant and a section of the Paris catacombs underneath huh. the Trecadero. Uh, they've well. also yeah. So the group's membership is largely secret, but I want in on it, and I want yes, in please. on it now. So if any of y'all are listening, Haley and I are we're up as long as you don't have to climb through any of those little holes. Uh, so yeah, and apparently they've been around since 1981. So that's my favorite. I that that's wow. my favorite. Yeah, that that is now my favorite too. Right? That's amazing. I love the. Can whole you imagine? Yeah. Wow. And just to have the, it's it's one thing to, there's so many facets. It's one thing to just build a little makeshift theater there. That's pretty yeah. awesome. But then to like fully wire it and then to wire it with three different phone lines and have like this, the closed circuit cameras in there, you know, clocking people coming in and out. And I'm like thinking back to 2004 and it's not like you could just walk into radio shack back then and get i mean there was some savvy that went into doing this and then for them to be monitoring it so closely well, i mean you could walk into radio shack back then well yeah but to get the <laughs> stuff for that like i don't know that that and then it had to go underneath ground like there's so many questions like i really want to know how they pulled it off like how i mean i'm sure that the phone lines were internet connections for the closed circuit television because it's 2004. Yeah. I graduated I it's pretty, from college yeah. in 2005. Um, and so I actually do vividly remember the technology that was available at that exact time. I want to know how so, long it was there before it was found. I, I don't. I want to know. And why couscous? Why not frozen pizza? There's a lot of questions here. I no popcorn, like couscous, though. I do. I like couscous, too. But I don't know that I would think of couscous in a movie. Huh. There's lots no? of questions. Yeah, I... Please get in touch. Seriously. If you, we'll keep you anonymous. If you know. I, yeah. What's the stuff we want to know? Yeah, we don't even need to share it. I'll bake we you just cookies. just want to know. <laughs> yes. 
Uh, same offer with vegan cookies, if that happens to be more enticing. Right? I'll couscous you some cookies. Like, uh, couscous cookies. I'll do... That's you know? a thing. Yeah, there you go. Couscous. Couscous chocolate cup cookies. There you go. I, I'm okay. into it. Now I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> that is so cool. Yeah. I feel really great about that. Right? And th- it was. I, I, I oscillated between... Dear God, no, those tunnels are so very tiny and you cannot breathe. To, I want to see that giant painting and we'll have to add them to the show notes or put them in the Patreon. Oh, is that the Patreon or the um, painting in the brewery? Uh, Is it of a girl that looks almost like Wednesday Addams? (laughs) Yes, I think so. (laughs) Yeah, that that was my favorite. But there's so many. Just the artwork down there is really impressive. Like. I, I gotta say that I am all for these cataphiles. Um, I think what they're doing is amazing because they are because they are very respectful. And yep. in the And mapping something that I mean, maps are actually not available to the public for this due to safety concerns. Right. Like so, I don't think you're even allowed to make them. Um Yeah. So to And be- so oh, how cool. It is. It's very cool. And the little dude that went down there with his crew mm-hmm. uh, bumped into, like, some random uh, cataphiles that were just hanging out with some candles. They're super cool. They're like, hey, what's up? Just, but yeah, I just, I can't imagine. There's there's such beauty down there, and it's weird that it's hidden. And at the same time, it's like, ugh, all those people just thrown together like that. It's so much... So much emotion and such a range of things in one... You can't say small place because it does go so far. Oh, it's but massive, but... It's such an interesting, interesting place. I mean, it's also sort of the thing where if you go, like, you know that anybody you run into is gonna be one of you. Right, And right. it doesn't really matter in what way they're one of you. Right. It's that, like you know that there's going to be that respect and, like, the camaraderie. Right. Maybe the help if you are turned around. I mean, because if you lose light... Right. You ain't getting out of there. Yeah. And I... That's really interesting. And, like, I sort of feel like if the cavern didn't need reinforcing and everything was installed professionally and they weren't doing any harm the police maybe should have just fucked right off and and let it happen but also once it was discovered i'm sure that that sort of ends right it ends the yeah and i get you know i'm i'm sure it was the liability standpoint thing. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I Which wouldn't I get have it, done but... anything different if <laughs> I were the police. I definitely would have been like, oh, hey, fire hazard. Also, <laughs> people are going to die down here and it's going to be my fault. Right. Nope. But, you know, at least but you know where you can still. put them. When... <laughs> <laughs> I am positive there have been additions additions to it he did find uh he went through a tiny little another hole that he and i don't know why this man would go through that hole but he ended up in this pit of bones basically and they were different you know a, a lot of femory looking bones but they were all broken down in straight bones they they you didn't see any skulls or like rib cages or there was sure. a super identifiable but i was like why why would you climb into that there's that's no so tiny and you could have gotten caught in there <laughs> i oh, in, in, no i got boobs and butt yep that ain't happening nope nope no <laughs> wow but also i really want to go right and i never want to go right so i think we need to we need to can we get a drone down there i feel like like that would echo really badly what about like k9 from doctor who can we build our own little k9 and strap a camera would have been terrible (laughs) at the catacombs can it just fall over right (laughs) and ask for help (laughs) 
Oh, yes. Nah. Bringing several variety of nerd all <laughs> no, into no one nerd tone. here. <laughs> yeah, no nerd stone goes unturned. Oh, we can think of a way. God. We can think of a way to get like a little robot in there and just take care of us. So we well, can feel like what about there? those? Uh, aren't they the Caltech? robots that figured yes. out how to get out yes, and left themselves and, and, and their fellow robots out <laughs> yes. of the lab. Those ones. Let's send those down there. Yes. Except they'll create a colony. That's how they we will. get the Terminator. That's Not true. from space, from underneath Paris. Underneath. Just make sure they don't have a, a shovel or a pick. Although they could probably use their fingers. Bones. Then. They could Bones. just m- fashion. I <sighs> And there's so many tools, so many tools that we can fashion from bones. But that's well, another and episode. limestone. Oh, <laughs> true. I mean, oh uh, maybe we better not. Maybe we better just <laughs> go okay, if we're gonna go, fine. or never go. <laughs> I don't know. Oh man. So maybe we should uh, wrap things up before. We get too jealous and or afraid. <laughs> Little bit of each. Um, yes. Yeah, we probably should. Yeah. All right. So, um, so friends, if you're listening, don't forget to lock your doors and don't run with scissors. Each episode of the Bones and Bobbins podcast is written and researched by Haley Pearson Cox and Natalie Hoyce. Our music was composed by Loyalty Freak Music. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Bones and Bobbins. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, follow us on Spotify, or check us out wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts so you won't miss a minute of our strange and creepy content. <laughs>